Welcome to the Flourish podcast with Dr. Tony Ingram, where you will hear straight from some of the best practitioners and leaders in wellness on how to take control of your family's physical, spiritual, and mental health, because we are all designed to flourish. I'm your host, Dr. Tony Ingram, and I'm so glad you're here today. Today is all things wisdom teeth. So this episode is cool for me, um, a very personal, because I got to take off my dentist hat for a little while and put on just my mama hat for a little bit because my oldest kiddo had her wisdom teeth taken out this week. It went really well, um, but I thought this would be a really good opportunity to talk about some of the more holistic approaches to wisdom teeth removal and what I did for my own kiddo. So we're going to do all things wisdom teeth today. We're going to talk about what they are, why you get them taken out, why some people don't get them taken out. Um, I'll take you through what to expect before, during, and after the procedure, including like a day by day, what you do each day after you've had it done. So I hope you enjoy and let's get to it. So wisdom teeth, what are they? They are the third set of molars that we have in our mouths. Um, I, for some reason, people thought that these only came in once you were old enough to have developed some wisdom. Uh, but these teeth come in sometimes like 17, 18, into your 20s. And I just don't know that many people in their early 20s who are all that wise yet. But nevertheless, that is where they got their name. So of the three sets of molars, we get one set when we're about six years old, another set when we're somewhere around 12 years old, and then the third set, the wisdom teeth, we get late teens, early 20s, just depending on how things are developing, sometimes much later. And sometimes we don't get them at all. So why did or why do we need wisdom teeth? Well, we actually don't need them quite as much as we did in the past, unfortunately, because our diets have changed. When you look at more ancestral diets, more primitive diets that included more animal foods, more rough plant foods that people were eating on a daily basis, then it was necessary to have these three sets of molars. Um, now, it's not as much the case. You know, over time, as we have more and more refined foods, more processed foods, our foods tend to be softer, then we are slowly developing to not need these quite so much anymore. Um, it, I hesitate to use the word evolution because that has other connotations that we'll say for another podcast altogether. But we are, in a sense, evolving not to need our wisdom teeth as much anymore. Or maybe we're just growing less wise. I don't know. So should you get your wisdom teeth removed? Well, that depends. It depends on the patient, on the age, and on how these teeth come in. Parents will ask me all the time, do you feel like all wisdom teeth should be removed? And I don't. I don't have that blanket rule or that blanket statement like some dentists used to have, and maybe a few still do have that. Um, but we have really good methods of being able to see how the wisdom teeth are developing and the direction that they're developing. So if it looks like the tooth is going to come in straight and is going to erupt beautifully and be in the bite and be functional, then I think we leave them alone. Uh, I think that's the, the kindest, most holistically holistic way to treat a patient is to let the body do what it's supposed to do on its own and let those teeth come in. Now, unfortunately, that happens less often than teeth that look like they're not going to come in normally. So more often it is the case that the wisdom teeth are either diagonal, they're leaning against those 12-year molars, or sometimes they're completely horizontal 
and look like they're, there's no way that they're going to come in normally. And if that's the case, then I think it makes more sense to go ahead and plan to remove them. And here's why. Because if we do nothing, and a, a lot of times, you know, there's, there's no pain involved in the wisdom teeth on a 17-year-old, typically speaking anyway. Um, a lot of times there, there are no symptoms at all. So is it worth it to get these wisdom teeth out if they don't hurt, if they don't bother the patient? And what I always tell pa- people is that usually what happens if we wait until adulthood, then at some point there's a high likelihood that those teeth become infected, that the wisdom teeth that are hiding below the gum line, that they become infected because food and bacteria just kind of gets tucked back behind those second molars and creates what's called pericoronitis, where you get an inflammation and then an infection in the tissue around those wisdom teeth. And usually when we see that happen is with people in their 30s. By that time, mom and dad aren't covering them on their insurance. They have, a lot of times, a young family of their own. They're busy, and they don't yet have a ton of disposable income that it's real convenient for them to take care of it. So that's why I say, and a lot of my colleagues say, just practically speaking, if you can tell that they're not going to come in normally on their own, I recommend getting them out in that late teens, early 20s time frame so that they're still either living at home or mom and dad are going to help pay for it. And they're young enough that they recover quickly. Everything is just easier and smoother. Um, and the age, the age that really is kind of our Goldilocks age that we talk about. It's not too young. It's not too old. Um, if we take the wisdom teeth out too young, like let's say we're looking at wisdom teeth on a 12, 13, 14-year-old, then the risk there is that there's so much bone covering those wisdom teeth that it's a more invasive procedure to have done. Well, on the opposite end of the spectrum, if we wait too late, if we wait till people are in their 30s, then, yeah, there may not be any bone covering those teeth, but the roots have had time to get really long. And so then it's a more invasive procedure in the opposite direction. Um, And also there's just something, there's just something magical about the healing powers of a teenager. They just heal incredibly fast so that it really almost makes no sense. Um, And then It's like when you hit 30, a light switches off and you no longer have those magic healing abilities. Um, I say that as someone who herself had her wisdom teeth taken out at 32 uh, and I was eating Advil like it was candy for a good four weeks after the procedure. I was pretty sore. Uh, So that's why I think for multiple reasons, If you're going to need them out, I think it makes sense and is kind of that perfect happy medium to get them out sometime late teens to early 20s. So let's talk about just some treatment planning considerations that your dentist is going to have and that you should be aware of too when deciding whether or not to have these teeth taken out and who you want to do the procedure. So the most important thing that I'm looking for as a general dentist is where those lower wisdom teeth are in relation to your nerve. There's a very large, it's called the inferior alveolar nerve that enters the mandibular canal and innervates the entire lower jaw on one side. And if the roots of the wisdom teeth get very long, Sometimes they can grow into, can kind of butt right up against that mandibular canal. Sometimes they even are in the canal itself. And then removing the tooth, it becomes much more risky that will do some nerve damage. And that is, unfortunately, that's one of the more, if there are a complications, that's one of the more common ones, that there's a little bit of nerve damage 
where you lose some sensation in the lower lip, um, which is obviously that's not what we want to happen. It's not that common, but again, it, it can happen. So we want to make sure that we know exactly where that nerve is in relation to the teeth. The upper wisdom teeth, the only thing we're really worried about is how close they are to the sinuses. You know, are the wisdom teeth actually within the sinus? We want to know that. But typically those upper wisdom teeth don't cause that many problems. So it's not a huge ordeal. Um, Now, who does the surgery? I would say, for one, do you want to be sedated or not? And whoever you choose needs to be qualified for whatever level of sedation that they're going to give you. And hopefully they're very, very comfortable administering that level of sedation. So this could be a general dentist. Um, If your general dentist is comfortable with the procedure and that's something that they is within their wheelhouse that they do all the time. Like I, for example, I will take out a few wisdom teeth if they look like they're really straightforward. If I can see all of them with my eyes, meaning they're completely erupted. um, And if the patient can open wide enough that I can get to it easily, then yeah, I feel very comfortable taking those wisdom teeth out and it's a no big deal. And, um, and typically these are not patients who want or need to be sedated for the procedure. Everybody else I want somebody else to do that procedure. So if the wisdom teeth are impacted at all, um, then I think it's much better done in the hands of somebody who removes wisdom teeth all the time. And that could still be a general dentist. I actually have a general dentist who comes to my office and that's all he does basically is take out wisdom teeth all day long, every day, and does IV sedation. Highly skilled, highly competent, Um, and does a fantastic job. And then there are other general dentists who just don't feel comfortable with that. And in that case, then you absolutely want an oral surgeon to do the procedure. And most oral surgeon offices, they do this procedure all day, every day. They are very comfortable doing IV sedation. And it's typically an easy, no big deal, very straightforward kind of uh, appointment for them. So, my own kiddo. We haven't talked about that yet. My kiddo is actually 14 and she just had her wisdom teeth taken out. Now, I I felt like it was a little bit early. I was really hesitant to have it done, but she, she wasn't just having her wisdom teeth taken out. She actually had what I call failure to launch of her 12 year molars. So molars that are supposed to come in at about the age of 12 she still did not have at the age of 14. And when we kept checking her x-rays, you know, appointment after appointment, year by year, it looked like they were blocked by the wisdom teeth that had formed really early and they were tipped forward and just didn't have the chance to come through normally on their own. So we decided to go ahead and do kind of an all of the above. It was, you know, a decision made by me as her mom and her general dentist, her orthodontist, and the oral surgeon. And we did what's called an ex- an expose and bond where the oral surgeon removed the gum tissue over those 12-year molars. He tipped it upright, kind of tapped things into place where they should be so that the orthodontist can get a bracket on that tooth. And then he removed the wisdom teeth that were in the way preventing it all from happening because we decided if she, you know, if she was going to have a procedure where she needed to be sedated, we only wanted to do this one time. So let's go ahead and get the wisdom teeth out while she's sedated. So that was our decision making there. Again, like I said, every case is different. So let's talk about the procedure itself, what you can expect day by day, and we'll go through traditional like mainstream things that are done and then we'll talk about some of the more fun holistic non-pharmaceutical options that you have too. So in the weeks before the surgery obviously you're going to schedule the surgery but as soon as you do then you can also schedule some fun follow-up appointments if you want to. 
I have some patients that will go see their chiropractor and their chiropractor will do some cold laser treatments on their, um, on their face and their neck to help things heal a little bit faster. Um, some patients will get some IV vitamins administered, which is a fantastic idea. It can help process the, um, the medications that you had that day, help your liver get rid of things faster and can help with inflammation. So I'm a huge fan of getting IVs, vitamins, specifically some high dose vitamin C and glutathione in the IV. Super, super helpful. And then I love any kind of treatment that can help your lymphatic system. Because again, most of that swelling is a clogging of the lymphatics. And the faster you can get the lymphatic system moving again, then the faster that swelling is going to go down. So we have a lymphatic therapist that actually comes to our office um, and uses a machine to help the lymphatic system drain just that much faster than it would on its own. You can also do lymphatic massage. That can be really nice. And there are even some fun gadgets where you can, I've seen, it almost looks like a pair of overalls that you lay down in and it strategically squeezes and releases your legs to get the lymphatic uh, fluids moving again, which is really cool. So anything that you can do to support the lymphatics is helpful, and that can be scheduled, you know, obviously several weeks to a couple of weeks out. Now, a week or so, maybe a few days ahead of time, you want to make sure you stock up on any kind of food or supplements you'll need. I highly suggest stocking up on bone broth or making your own and putting it in the freezer and having that ready to go because you want something that is going to be really nutrient dense and really healing, but also something that they don't have to chew. So you don't want to have to chew. Bone broth is really the perfect food to have for immediately post-stop after you've had your wisdom teeth taken out. So make sure you stock stock up on that, or like I said, make your own because it's really easy to make. Um, And then any supplements that you want to take as well. For instance, in my house, we had lots of liposomal vitamin C, we had liposomal glutathione, and and just some arnica, some mouthwashes, things like that, that we'll go over here in a bit. Now, the day or the night before, there's not a lot that you have to do, and the surgeon's office will give you clear instructions on when they want you to stop eating and drinking, because if you're going to be sedated, especially if it's an IV sedation, they want you to have an empty stomach. So they'll either tell you, you know, 12 hours before or midnight the night before, they'll let you know when they no longer want you to have any food or drink so that you don't... um, So that there's nothing on your stomach to get just in case your stomach gets upset during the procedure. They don't want there to be anything on there for you to accidentally throw up because that would not be fun for anybody. The day of the procedure, the again, just wear nice, comfy clothes. Um, My kiddo brought like a fun little squishy thing that she could hold on to. I think it was a squishmallow because those are super popular now. Um, bring a blanket if you want to bring a blanket. Again, most surgeons' offices have things like this. Most dental offices have blankets. Um, but whatever makes you comfy and make sure that you're either wearing short sleeves or sleeves that can be rolled up easily in case you have an IV. You want to make sure that they can get to where they need to get to easily and quickly. But other than that, that's really all you have to do. And then you just show up and take a nap and everything's great. Um, Now, when you get to the office the day of the procedure, again, like I said, for the patient, just show up, be comfy, and take some some deep breaths because really all the hard work is not having to be done by you, thankfully. You just get to take a nap and enjoy. Now, the day of, if you're a parent, uh, what I do, don't usually think to tell families that are patients of mine. But now that I've recently gone through this, I think I will make sure that I will will remind parents that they need something too to keep themselves occupied. Because of course, anytime we've got a kid that's going to be sedated, 
Of course, there is risk involved, and we're always going to worry about our kiddos anytime there's a risk involved. Um, so like any parent, I was I was on my phone. I was reading all of the things in the surgeon's office that they had to read. Uh, they were even they were really sweet and took me on a tour of the office and let me see like their aesthetic side of the office, which was fun. Um, they were sweet. So anything that you can do to distract yourself. And I actually bought some box rescue remedy. It's a homeopathic stress relief. Um, I bought it for for my kid, but I wound up taking it more than she did. Uh, so that was nice to have a little bit of stress relief the day of the procedure. Now, if you are having a more holistic practitioner do the procedure, or even if you're not, a, there are many mainstream practices who have these treatment methods now that I think are really fun. So some things that you can ask about for during the procedure. One is ask if they use PRF. And PRF just stands for platelet-rich fibrin. It, it's when they take a sample of your blood and they spin it in a centrifuge for a specific amount of time. And then the golden goodness that floats to the top contains a ton of stem cells and cells that have really amazing healing properties. So we take that PRF plug. It's, you know, it solidifies, it clots on its own the way that it's supposed to. And we place it in the socket, in the extraction site, and then allow that to work its magic in the extraction site, which is really, really cool. Uh, so a, a lot of surgeons are using that now. It's, it can really be helpful, can help speed up the healing process. Uh, ozone is another method that I really love. I use ozone in every single procedure just about that we do in the office and what it does when you use medical grade ozone is it helps kill bacteria, it kills viruses, fung fungi, um, it kills all the bad stuff. But with our healthy cells, it actually provides it this supercharged oxygen ion that helps upregulate the immune response. So again, it helps your body do what it's supposed to do naturally, but it helps it do it better and faster. Um, a lot of times surgeons will use collagen plugs. That can be nice. Um, and again, a lot of them will use IV vitamins at the end of the procedure. Um, and that, that's something that we do in our office a lot. We'll have an IV therapist come and administer the vitamins, you know, either while they're asleep or right at the end of their procedure. Now, once the procedure is done, you will likely have some, you will hopefully have very good post-op instructions. They'll give you a sheet of things to do and not do. And what I notice and what you might notice too, if you go to several different practitioners, is that everyone's instructions are a little bit different. And I love that they're a little bit different. Each person that does dental work, each surgeon, each practitioner has things that they have come to rely on over the years that give them the most predictable results and the best results for healing. So we all have our favorites. That's why our sheets are all a little bit different. Um, but that also means that you've got some wiggle room. There's not you know, a law that says any one particular instruction that they give you is more important than the other. Um, so I always tell patients afterwards, um, I say, you know, we're going to give you a sheet that has very detailed instructions. My assistant is going to go over very detailed instructions. But the most important thing to keep in mind is to use your common sense. And if it's hurting, uncomfortable, if it doesn't feel like you're ready, then you're not ready and cut back. Um, but don't, I, I'm not real dogmatic on exactly which instructions we follow and, and when and how. So the most important things are to keep the area clean. And you'll do that. They'll, we'll give you ways to do that 
by either brushing the teeth when you're ready, or it can be as simple as just rinsing with salt water or um, rinsing with a good mouthwash. Um, sometimes they will, you know, a lot of times they'll give you a prescription for a an antimicrobial rinse, and that, oh, there's, I don't have a nice way to say it. I hate that antimicrobial rinse. I think that stuff is junk. Uh, it does an excellent job at killing bacteria, but I think it goes way overboard. It has alcohol in it. It has a really inconvenient side effect of raising blood pressure sometimes. And so I, you should do what your surgeon says. Uh, but that method is not my favorite. I think it's much safer and still effective to use good old fashioned salt water because salt water will kill bacteria also. It will also help with inflammation and does a really nice job. Um, for my patients and my kiddo, we actually use a homeopathic rinse that um, has some really good clean ingredients in it and also does a nice job. It's a little, a little more pleasant to the taste than salt water. Um, this it's Stella Life. We have this at the office all the time. We use it for a ton of our patients, and uh, and that really is all that you need. All right. So diet. Once you get home, uh, the most important thing is that you hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. In fact, I want you to overhydrate. Um, if you had some IV sedation, they'll have some fluids in there too. So you're not going to be dehydrated, but dehydration is the most common cause of pain, discomfort, and nausea the day of the procedure. So I want you drinking as many fluids as you can stand, um, and just be okay with getting some rest and going to the potty every once in a while. And that's going to be the rest of your day. Definitely want you to get lots of rest and control bleeding. Now, most of the time, your bleeding is going to be really easy to control. You'll have some gauze that they give you as you leave the office, and they'll probably give you some extra. I would say more than half the time, you don't even need that extra gauze that they give you because things have already stopped bleeding. They'll just ooze for a little bit afterwards. Um, one trick that we like to tell patients is, for one, when it comes to bleeding in the mouth, it always looks so much worse than it really is. As long as your gauze is pink and not red, then that just means that you've got blood that's mixed with a lot of saliva. So it looks like there's a lot, but there's really not that much. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Bleeds in the mouth always look icky and scary, but they're typically not that bad. Now, if you are having, like, let's say your gauze is not pink, let's say it's bright red or really dark red, um, then what you'll want to do is get some nice clean gauze and get enough in there that you can put in the surgical sites and then hold some pressure on it for a few minutes. Usually after 10 or 15 minutes, that'll take care of it. If it doesn't, then you're going to want to get some tea bags. And so I think part of your list that you, your grocery list that you have ahead of time should include some black tea if you don't already keep it in the house. Because if you have a little bit of bleeding afterwards and just pressure on gauze isn't doing the trick, then what you can do is just take your bag of black tea and get it a little bit wet and squishy and then place that back there in the extraction sites. And what will happen is the tannins in the tea will help the blood clot faster. Now, if that's still not working and you're still filling up gauze with either dark red or bright, bright red blood and it's you're not having any luck, then at that point, I want you to make sure that you're calling the surgeon's office, that you're calling that doctor's office, talking with either the doctor or the assistant to make sure they're aware of the situation and can give you any tips that they might want to give you too. Okay, so the other thing that your surgeon or your dentist will probably do is prescribe you one or more medications, prescription medications. 
Um, a lot of times this is maybe an antibiotic, um, might be a prescription pain medication, sometimes some anti-nausea medicine, and maybe that prescription mouth rinse. Um, so just know that, yes, you should follow what your surgeon wants you to use within reason. It's always up to you what you choose to take and not take, but anything they prescribe you means that they have found that that works best for them and their patients and gives the most predictable results, the most predictable healing outcomes. But if you, if your doctor is okay with it, then I'll give you a few alternatives that you can, you can use instead of these two. So let's go through now day by day after your procedure is done. So day zero, meaning the day of the procedure. Like I said before, lots of let rest and lots of fluids. The most important thing is that you have, um, you're very hydrated and that you can process all of the medications that you've been given that day. Um, for cleaning of the area, for cleaning of your mouth, all you really have to do, if you can comfortably get a toothbrush in there and brush your front teeth, that's fine. If not, then at least rinse with salt water or your prescription rinse or your homeopathic rinse, whatever you happen to be using. Pain medication, I would go ahead and take something for pain as soon as you get home. Because one thing about pain is that it is so much easier to manage if you get ahead of it than if you wait until you're hurting and miserable. It's, and this goes for prescription pain meds or over-the-counter or even homeopathics. It's just easier to get ahead of pain than it is to have to catch up and get to it. Um, other things that you can do the day of the procedure is just help your body detox a little better. You want to give your liver and your lymphatic system some love. So if you want to do some IV vitamins at this point, like if your surgeon didn't have that available, then the day of the procedure is a great time to get some IV vitamin C, some IV glutathione, and it'll help you feel better, recover faster, and help decrease some of that inflammation. Another thing that you can do is an Epsom salt bath and any kind of bath feels nice after a stressful day and that granted you were hopefully napping and it was not stressful at all, but still that's a big day. Um, so a nice warm bath with some Epsom salt would be really nice and will help your body again, heal, detox, control some inflammation. So that's day zero. That's the day of the procedure. Now, as we go to days one through three, this is when controlling swelling and controlling pain are most important. Oh, goodness. I can't believe I forgot. Day zero, ice. Oh, ice is the most important. Um, that is one of the best things that you can do to help minimize the swelling that you have on days one through three is to make sure that you ice on the day of the procedure as soon as you get home. So a lot of times your surgeon will give you this cute little ice pack that you wear around your chin and it Velcros up above. It's adorable. Um, you'll want to make sure to take lots of pictures of your kids and use that for uh, whatever you might want to use it for later when you need to embarrass them a little bit. Um, but they'll usually give you some kind of ice pack. Uh, if not, then make sure you have your own ice pack ready to go as soon as you get home. That will help minimize the swelling and minimize the inflammation. Um, again, days one through three, you want to continue your pain management throughout. I would not stop whatever you're using for pain. Don't, don't try to tough it out. I say don't try to tough it out and wait until you're hurting to take something. I say stay ahead of it that entire time and keep the pain managed. Um, now, Pain management is a big category, and there are lots of both medications and non-pharmaceutical methods that we can use to minimize pain after any kind of surgical procedure. So prescription pain management will include a lot of times some opioid medications, maybe like a Tylenol with codeine or a Vicodin equivalent, 
something like that. Um, they honestly, they are prescribed less and less. Wisdom teeth is one of the things they are still commonly prescribed for, but I find them to be not extremely effective and they do have side effects. They have the potential for habit formation. You know, they can be addicting if you're taking them for a long period of time. Um, they also have the side effects of causing some nausea and some constipation. So you can absolutely take them if you feel like you need them. If the over-the-counter medications aren't controlling pain or if you are already, like let's say you're an adult and you're already on a couple of prescription medications, it might take that prescription pain med to get your pain under control and get it managed. Um, but most of the time for your teenagers, for folks in their 20s, I would say most of the time the over-the-counter medication is going to be just as effective, if not more effective, and with fewer side effects. So that's kind of my my spiel on the prescription pain meds. There, I'm glad we have them. They can be useful in some cases, um, but I just don't love them for most dental procedures. Now, when we're talking about over-the-counter pain management, these have risks too. Um, the most effective over-the-counter pain medication is going to be your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, your NSAIDs, and that is your ibuprofen and your Aleve. So ibuprofen like Motrin, Advil, something like that. Those are going to help control inflammation without severely thinning the blood or increasing bleeding very much. Um, they are processed by the kidney and not the liver. So there's less of a likelihood for any kind of toxicity and they work very well. They're typically very effective. So ibuprofen is kind of my favorite if for something major like wisdom tooth extraction or a bad toothache or something like that, you can actually alternate your pain meds. And really, you can do this m several different ways. The most common and kind of my favorite method of pain management with over-the-counter meds is to alternate ibuprofen and Tylenol. And so what you'll do is you'll take you know, normal dosages. You're not doing an extra dose or anything like that. You'll take, say, let's say your Advil and you'll take Tylenol. And I would take the Advil first, the ibuprofen. Um, and I would like, for instance, if you're going to take the Advil at noon, then you would take your Tylenol at two and then you'd be ready for more Advil at four and more Tylenol at six so that you've got something in your system all the time that's helping with pain management and you're never going through that dip where you're really uncomfortable as your medication is wearing off. So that tends to be the best way to manage that moderate intensity pain. Now, you can also do this with prescription pain medication, but you want to make sure that you really get specific instructions on this from your dentist or your surgeon first to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, but some of the opioids like Tylenol with codeine can be used in that alternating pattern with the ibuprofen because they're different classes of drugs. So you can do like a Tylenol with codeine and then two hours later do your ibuprofen and alternate them that way. So, or even use that to space out the amount of time that you're using the prescription pain med so that you're not having to take as many. Um, but again, make sure you have specific instructions from your dentist or surgeon to make sure that you're doing that correctly and you're not getting uh, too much of a dosage of any one particular drug. Um, now, non-pharmaceutical pain management is something that I absolutely love and am fond of. And my patients have really taught me the most about it. Um, I don't think I would have had the, the courage to try surgical pain management without some sort of medication had my patients not already tried it, had good experience with it, and, and then come back to tell me what they had been doing. Um, so some non-pharmacological pain management could be 
just homeopathics. And homeopathics, like we've got some arnica um, that it can be in a pellet or a tincture. Arnica is a really good homeopathic. Um, there are some mixtures, some homeopathic blends. And, you know, you can get plenty of these blends at the health food store or even on Amazon. But if you've got, I mean, if you have access to a homeopathic doctor that makes her own homeopathics like we do here in the Dallas area um, with Dr. Somaya at Hygieia Homeopathy, that obviously that would be ideal if you have a homeopathic doctor that is making those remedies for you. Uh, because I just so happens I um, this homeopathic doctor who is my friend, uh, Dr. Somaya, she has her own homeopathic blend that she gives to her patients for our she gives them to me. I get them from her for our infants who are having little infant phrenectomies done. And she gives the same remedy to her patients who are having major abdominal surgery. And a lot of times those patients are avoiding all of their pharmaceutical pain meds and only using the homeopathic remedies. Just incredible, incredible if that can be done. Um, so if you have access to that, incredibly valuable. Um, other non-pharmaceutical pain management, really just maintaining the swelling, you know, the ice, the lymphatic treatments, all of those things, the IV vitamins, those can help with pain so that you need less medication, which is a fabulous thing to do. Um, essential oils are a really good option. So you can use different essential oils on the outside of the face, the outside of the jawline, uh, there's, if you'll go with some of the, the really enthusiastic essential oil people, and they'll have topical pain relief. They'll even have some that you can ingest. Like there are recipes online for what's called a morphine bomb using organic essential oils. Um, I would say be careful if you do that and make sure that you're asking advice from the proper professionals because I have also heard people who say that you should not be ingesting essential oils at all. So if that's something you decide to do, make sure you're really comfortable and you're um, checking in with, again, with your surgeon or your dentist to make sure that that's okay for your specific situation. Um, but those can be really good ways to manage pain in those days following the procedure, Those, especially those first three days. Now, Days four, five, and beyond, you're going to maybe still be using your pain management, whatever that may be, whether it's homeopathics or, or pharmaceuticals. Um, but you'll be in kind of a rhythm and can probably start cutting back on your dosing by then, by days four and five. Also in days four and five, you can start being a little more diligent with your cleaning a lot of times they'll give you this little syringe to actually clean in the sockets themselves. And that's okay to start using on day four or five. You don't want to use it before because you don't want to dislodge the clot from the socket. Um, but that just helps keep the area clean. And again, helps that healing process do what it's supposed to do on its own. Now, after the weak point, like day six and beyond, you're going to be in a groove. Things are going to get better much faster. You might still have like some muscle soreness. Things might still be a little stiff. You might not be able to open all the way. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to be feeling pretty good. Um, for my adult patients, you know, especially those who have their wisdom teeth out at age 30 and beyond, this is where my adult patients get a little more frustrated. It's, you know, not days one through five, when they're expecting to be in pain and be a little uncomfortable, it's past that because they're still sore and they're still needing a little bit of pain control with whatever medication or substance they may be using. And that can be frustrating when you're ready to get back to your life and be feeling better. Um, you might still have a little bit of soreness. So usually that one week point and later, our teens are kids in their 20s are usually doing really well. 
Um, if you're in your 30s, then you might be or or beyond, then you might have a little more soreness. And then it starts to get just really annoying that you're still sore and you can't open all the way to eat a really big hamburger. So if that's the case, be patient. It does go back. You will be able to open all the way again. Uh, it just takes time. Now, what my own kiddo did, what we did with my own child. So again, she was a little younger than we typically suggest people have their wisdom teeth removed. We knew ahead of time and the surgeon said, you know, because we're doing a a few extra things, she's going to have a little more swelling than average. It's going to, because it's going to be a little more invasive of a procedure. So obviously as a holistic dentist, I was ready to do all the things for the kid. We got the bone broth ready. We got our soups. We got all of our supplements. And I said, okay, after the procedure, I'll schedule for you to have some IV vitamins and we'll do some vitamin C and glutathione and IV. And she, she looked at me and without a beat said, absolutely not. Uh, because her, her one fear with the entire procedure, the whole ordeal was that she didn't want to see the needles She didn't want to watch the IV. She was scared of the IV going into her arm. Um, And so the thought of her doing another IV after the procedure was already done was a no-go for her. So so I allowed that to be a no-go for her, and I calmed down just a little bit. Um, So what we did do is we scheduled some lymphatic therapy for her, um, As soon as we got done with the procedure, we iced her up. She had on her little ice pack and we went, actually, we went back to my office and had the lymphatic therapist who comes to my office, um, had her do some lymphatic treatment on her right then and there to go ahead and help start flushing things out. Um, then as soon as we got home, we got her and I, I did not, ask her to try to do no pharmaceutical products at all. We did over-the-counter pain management and some homeopathics. We did a combination of both. Um, So as soon as we got home, we did her dose of ibuprofen and some vitamins. And what we did, so for pain management, the first couple of days, um, I because she was worried that she'd be swollen and would have trouble swallowing pills um, is we are avoiding the 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 capsules of ibuprofen for right now. And we opted for the liquid just for now. Um, So she's doing liquid ibuprofen. And in between doses of that, she's actually spacing her doses out quite a bit and is doing fine as far as pain management goes. And in between, we're doing just some Arnica pellets, which has worked really nicely for her. Again, we're keeping ice in there as much as we can. Um, The Box Rescue Remedy, it's a homeopathic stress relief. I got that for her um, for the night before because I knew she was a little nervous. And the day of, she really didn't need it. I'm the one who needed it more because my kiddo was having a procedure done and I was nervous about it. Um, so I highly recommend the, the rescue remedy, um, for the mamas. If you're having to take your baby to get her wisdom teeth taken out, I think that was a good option. I think it was a little bit helpful. Um, again, afterwards we did liposomal vitamins. So again, we were trying to avoid her having to swallow any pills, at least for the first couple of days. Um, and Since she wasn't going to do any IV vitamins, we wanted to make sure she had the most absorbable kind. And they process these liposomal vitamins in like a lipid sphere. So it's more easily absorbable by the tissues in the intestines, um, more so than your water-soluble vitamins. So liposomal vitamins is super helpful and you can also take a higher dose of the vitamin C because to be honest, if you did like a capsule of a normal vitamin C, a normal ascorbic acid, a capsule after you take, you know, a couple of grams, then it is very common for you to get some gastric upset. Like it can 
cause diarrhea if you take too much of it. Uh, with the liposomal vitamin C, you can usually take a much higher dose before you hit that point at which it causes the gastric troubles. Um, so again, <laughs> if we, we don't want the prescription meds that cause constipation, but we don't want the supplements that cause diarrhea either. So the liposomal vitamin C is a good way to do that. So what she took, again, she did her liquid ibuprofen, and then she did her liposomal vitamin C, and she did her liposomal glutathione. And that was what, that was kind of her post-op thing. And again, she's in between her doses of ibuprofen. She's doing some Arnica, and that's really about it. Um, Now, I think... Oh, the other thing that she took, I almost forgot, is we decided because she's very low risk for any type of infection, um, she has no health issues, and we really didn't want to risk the potential side effects of an antibiotic. Um, Plus, I'm monitoring things very carefully. There's actually limited data now that antibiotics after wisdom teeth removal are helpful Um, so we decided to not do antibiotics, but we still want to make sure we're supporting her microbiome. And so we added a few drops of biocidin, which is an herbal remedy. And again, it has different, different herbal remedies that can help support a nice, healthy microbiome, make sure the good bugs are where they need to be and the bad bugs are staying minimized. So we did a little bit of that too. Um, And again, we're going to make sure that we keep things nice and clean. She's doing a homeopathic rinse several times a day. And and that's kind of what she's doing. Um, After that initial, so, you know, the date of the procedure, she had that one lymphatic treatment done. She's been icing like crazy. And then she took a day off where she still rested a little bit. Um, And now today is, let's see, today is day three. Um, Now that she's on day three, she's really past the worst of it. And luckily, we scheduled another lymphatic therapy session with Jessica Metz of Richardson and Rockwall Lymphatics. Um, She, again, she comes to my office and slightly more tends to work a little faster and is a little more efficient than a lymphatic massage. She uses a machine that helps stimulate the lymphatic flow, get things moving, and helps the lymphatic system not only process the swelling, um, but helps everything detox, get rid of all the, the yucky medications that she had to take for her sedation, and will just help that swelling minimize even faster, hopefully. So even though she had a little bit of swelling, even though the surgeon said that she would have more than average swelling, I think she her swelling, really considering all she had done, is pretty minimal. Uh, just a little bit of chipmunkiness uh, that just makes her look like she's got a little bit of gum in her mouth, <laughs> which is really not too bad. Uh, and and you get to see it too. So. Here is a a little snippet of our time with Jessica Metz this morning, getting her lymphatic treatment done. So I hope that gives you some really good information on the decision-making process on whether you should have wisdom teeth removed or not. Again, it's not a cut and dry question. Every patient and every situation is different. Um, I really encourage you, obviously, don't take it all from me. Make sure that you're discussing these issues with your dentist, with your surgeon, with your healthcare team, because that's so important. Um, But know that these decisions are always yours. Um, You get to make the decisions, so make them in an educated way. Um, Take this information and talk to your doctors about it, and I hope it's helpful. I hope you gained some good insight and, um, 
and are empowered to make decisions that are best for you and your family today. Uh, Again, this is Dr. Tony Ingram. Thank you so much for being with us today, and we'll see you next time.